David Jeremiah once said, God has given us the gift of faith that we can take what's unseen and make it a part of who we are. Uh, It's tempting and common, I think, to live our lives in such a way that we primarily allow ourselves to be influenced by what we see and experience in the natural realm every day, right? That which is right in front of us day in and day out, instead of allowing our lives to be primarily guided by that which we cannot see, regardless of what is in front of us at any given moment, which is, of course, a significant aspect of having faith as a follower of Jesus Christ, the faith to trust in that which is unseen. And yet, obviously, we cannot and should not ignore the reality of our uh, surroundings as we go through life, right? We know that God is the God of the supernatural, and He's the God of the natural. He's the God of the heavens and the earth. He's the God of the spiritual and the physical. So obviously, I'm not suggesting we ignore uh, the reality of our daily lives that we're able to see with our eyes and touch with our hands. I'm simply saying that at the same time, we should not ignore the equally genuine reality that there is an unseen aspect to our lives as followers of Jesus Christ, an unseen spiritual realm that we cannot perceive with our eyes or touch with our hands. And yet I think sometimes we pay little to no attention to that very real activity that is going on as God is working through us and around us all the time on our behalf, simply because it isn't always uh, as naturally discernible by our physical senses, right? So I think... I think sometimes it can be easy for us to forget that God is constantly at work, even when we don't always see any evidence of that. And so as a result, when we don't have something we need, we often become anxious about our lack, even though Jesus said, your father knows what you need before you ask him, Matthew 6, 8. And even though Paul said, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19, or when we're uncertain about our future, and we become completely unsettled about things that may or may not even happen, even though David said, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them, Psalm 139. 16. And even though God explained to Jeremiah concerning his people that I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. Or when we feel alone and vulnerable and weak and, and fearfully we search for something to fill that emptiness, even though God said to Isaiah, fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41.10, it can be easy for us to become uh, seduced into patterns in life where we're constantly reacting to whatever we see or sense right in front of us, rather than trusting in that which we cannot see or sense in the moment. And as a result, uh, you can work yourself half to death trying to fill the need or secure the future or create a different picture for yourself which inevitably for so many people can turn into a a real burnout from the constant effort of trying to manage these burdens that you were never intended to carry. And that's that's an exhausting way to live. I can testify to that firsthand. I'm I'm the poster child for uh, take control and get it done Uh, so, uh, so that all the uncertainties are removed from the picture. That's like how I operate. I always want to have all the bases covered and all the questions answered before I even get there. It's just the way I'm wired. But of course, when you try to live that way, uh, first of all, the only person you're fooling is yourself. And in the process, you you wear yourself out. Because the fact is, listen, uh, we can never tie off all the loose ends. We can never guarantee our own future. We can never see to it that every single need is met before the need even arrives, as hard as we try, right? We keep on trying, which ultimately just leads to more frustration and often more weariness, if not a a total burnout situation. So as a part of the process of maturing as a Christ follower, we have to learn to trade in our reliance on what is seen for that which is unseen, which we have to be willing, right, to exchange our trust in that which is measurable for the one who's altogether immeasurable. We have to be able to relinquish our confidence in what we can control to a God who could never be controlled. And, I'm, and I'm, understand, I'm not talking about a lack of effort on our part, by the way. Um, we were created to work hard and give 100% effort in all that we do. I'm talking about the things that we allow to control us, to control our thoughts and emotions 
after we've done our level best. I'm talking about what we allow to go on between our ears, even when we're diligent and faithful to that which God has called us to. Because if we're being honest, there are people uh, who worry about the future because they're lazy. They don't take responsibility for themselves and their families, and they expect things to be given to them, and they're unwilling to do anything that they find uninteresting or difficult. Well, quite honestly, those people should be worried. Second uh, Thessalonians 3.10, Paul says, If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. First Timothy 5.8, he explains, that If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now look, if the Bible describes you as worse than an unbeliever, you should probably be worried. Now, if you've been here any amount of time, you understand we feed hungry people all the time. We clothe people, particularly in the wintertime who need warm clothing. Uh, we've paid more bills, power bills, gas bills, repair bills. We've provided housing and transportation and medical care and school supplies and all manner of personal needs, more than I can count. There, there's genuine need, of course, in people's lives all around us all the time, and with genuine compassion, we pay attention to and we respond to those needs on a regular basis. But if we're being honest, there's also a percentage of the population who have everything they need at their disposal to care for themselves and their families, and yet they refuse to do so. And Scripture reserves some harsh words for people who choose to live like that. But those, those aren't the people that this message is focused on today, okay? We're talking about those of us who fret and worry and strive to take care of things that we're not responsible to fret or worry or strive for. Because there are aspects of our lives where only God can affect the outcome. So look, once you've done everything he's commanded you to do, once you've been diligent in your work and committed in your care for others and consistent in the spiritual disciplines that go along with being a Christ follower, once you've done all you can to see to it that your body's healthy and your family is secure and your needs are met, what happens after that in the future? It's entirely up to God because he's in control. We're not. And, and just because we cannot see anything happening in our favor on our behalf at times, it does not in any way mean that nothing is happening because God is constantly working on our behalf. And so sometimes we simply need to wait for the results, even though we cannot see or always discern is working while it's happening. Isaiah 64, 4 describes God as someone who acts for those who wait for him. And certainly God often works through other people and circumstances that we can observe and interact with while he's working, but sometimes that's not the case. After Jesus rose from the dead and appeared before Thomas, who finally decided to believe that Jesus was in fact alive, only after seeing him with his own eyes, Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John 20, 29. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. Peter, speaking about the hope that we have in Christ, he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that tested genuous, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so, although we tend to put a lot of stock in that which we can see, what should truly ground us, what should anchor our confidence in our future, is ultimately found in what is unseen. And so we're going to talk about God's unseen work today and how we can actually interact with his unseen work on our own behalf because we have some significant needs that we're asking God to meet this year not only for many of us individually but for this church as a whole which we'll talk about as we go and listen uh, it's not like there's nothing we can do about that okay there's actually much that we can do to participate in the unseen work of God in our lives and in our church in order to be able to accomplish what he's called us to do. And there's no better example of that in our uh, scripture than our story today in the book of Daniel chapter 10, which has a very meaningful application for our lives when it comes to the unseen activity that God is engaged in uh, on our behalf. So we're going to read it together. Daniel chapter 10. We'll start with the first three verses. 
In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had uh, understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for, full, uh, for the full three weeks. So, first of all, this is the passage of Scripture that the Daniel fast which we're starting uh, tomorrow as a church, is based on. There's a similar type of fast that Daniel performs back in chapter 1, which was for 10 days. And I know you're thinking right now, why didn't we do that one? Uh, That was for completely different reasons and with completely different results than this fast in chapter 10, uh, with this fast really being more applicable to what we're asking the Lord for this year at Upcountry Church. So we're going to focus on this passage of Scripture and consequently this fast including the reasons for it and the results from it. But first, just to give you some context, okay? This was the third year of the reign of King Cyrus, 536 B.C., which means that two years earlier, the first group of Jewish exiles had returned to Jerusalem to begin the rebuilding process under the decree of Cyrus and the leadership of Ezra. So God's people here are trying to enter into a building program. The problem is they're facing significant opposition, and so the work had stopped, and the people there, as you can imagine, are under great discouragement. The, the Hebrews had lived in captivity uh, for decades, waiting for an opportunity to return to their homeland and rebuild their city and the temple. And now that they've finally made it there, they're unable to fulfill this dream of rebuilding because of the conflict they're facing from those around them, uh, people who didn't want the city to be rebuilt. So Daniel who did not return with this group of exiles, by the way, probably at this, because at this point he's 84 years old, much more able to help his own people from his high position in government than he would have been in, in the rebuilding work itself. Uh, although as a point of identification with the discouragement of his people who are facing overwhelming opposition, Daniel was in mourning for three weeks, 21 days, in order to seek answers and action from God on behalf of God's people. So Daniel stopped eating the choice foods that were available to him, including meat, and he stopped drinking wine, and he abstained from using the lotions that were commonly used that made life in a dry desert climate much more bearable. That doesn't mean you can stop using deodorant for three weeks. Uh, We want people who come here to want to stay in here with us. So So Daniel's taking the reality of what's happening to his people very seriously, right? Because the dream that he held for so long is not panning out like he thought it would. Now, uh, first of all, how many of us can relate to that, right? I mean, life certainly doesn't always turn out like we think it will, and we can mourn the circumstances that are happening in the physical realm in our everyday lives. Uh, That has certainly been the case uh, for me and Mary Beth and our staff over our need and desire for facilities, a building that will allow us to do what we know God has called us to do in order to more effectively reach this community, I'm talking about the community right here in these walls, but also the community around us and the world beyond that. And and we've been talking about it for a long time now, the need for Christian education. You're gonna hear that a lot from me over the next few months as we go into a new sermon series. Uh, We're we're talking about this rebuilding, the need for Christian education here, Sunday school, not just for our kids, but for our adults all the way through. Uh, we want to go deeper and further in God's word than we can do in 40 minutes in, in a sermon on a Sunday morning. We want to do that together as a body. Why? To build up this body for the work before us, to make disciples so that we can reach the lost. We, we want to effectively reach our community for Christ. And yet, as of now, we don't have an available square inch left in the three buildings we're currently uh, using to, to do any of that, okay? Not to mention the inability to bring our kids in, which I've talked about, who are currently at a different address, to bring them in under the same roof with us. Uh, we lose families, literally we lose, lose a number of families every year because our kids are at a different address. Uh, we want to expand our outreach, uh, our administrative and counseling and staff capacity. We want to do all of that this year um, because we don't have enough physical space Uh, We can't do any of that. And so, as most of you already know, we're simply responding to a vision that God gave us for reaching our community for Christ by trying to enter into a building program. And yet, at every single turn, I mean, we have gone after every large building in this town when they've gone up for sale since 2020, vigorously. We've tried to add on here 
and we don't have enough property, and we've worked on getting more property. I mean, at every single turn, we've been met by opposition, whether trying to obtain new facilities that are for sale or by building our own current facilities. And I'm telling you, it's not a stretch to identify with Daniel here, who is wrecked over the fact that he has a clear vision from God about what is next for the people of God. Right? Daniel's comfortable. He's not being tortured. He's not in prison. He's in a high position in government. He has a comfortable life. And he's wrecked over the fact that he has a clear vision from God about what is next for the people of God. And yet at the same time, he's unable to see the vision come to fruition because of the barriers between them and that vision being fulfilled. And so Daniel takes action, definitive, sacrificial action, because he understands, as should we, that as much as there is always activity happening in the world every day that affects the lives of everyone in it, There is just as much, if not more, otherworldly activity happening in the spirit realm that we cannot see that affects the everyday lives of people as well. And this uh, is something that Daniel is about to experience firsthand as we continue in the story. So let's read it, verses 4 through 6. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes up and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. So Daniel's standing on the bank of the Tigris River when he sees a man who's obviously not of this world. But it says he was clothed in linen which is probably like the fine white linen that the priests wore. It says he had a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist, and we're told from the uh, uh, Jerusalem Talmud, it's a collection of ancient uh, Hebraic rabbinical writings from the second century, that Uphaz was a gold-bearing region of ancient times that produced the finest gold there was. It says that his body was like beryl, which was a, a precious stone that was translucent. His face was like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like bronze, and his voice like a multitude. And there are similarities here with this vision and the vision of John um, that he has of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1. However, this is more likely an angel that reflected the glory of Christ rather than the Christ himself, because as we'll see later in chapter 13, this person speaking to Daniel explains that he needed help in his fight against the spiritual forces over Persia. And of course, Jesus would not need to ask for help from an angel while doing battle. And we also see other instances in Scripture, particularly in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel sees angelic beings dressed in linen in chapter 9 and who reflected the glory of God, which we also see in chapters 1 and 10. So uh, Daniel's confronted here by this angel who many scholars believe to be the angel Gabriel because he's the one who appears to Daniel in other earlier visions. And though we don't know for 100% that it was Gabriel. But clearly, he brilliantly reflects the glory of Jesus Christ. And the effect is overwhelming for Daniel, just as you'll find in previous chapters. Daniel is totally wrecked at the sight of God's messenger. Let's read verses 7 through 10. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and I heard the sound of his words. I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. Uh, Okay, so Daniel is out cold on the ground. As soon as he sees and hears this angel of the Lord, and, and right, who wouldn't be, honestly? I mean, when you read the description here, It must have been absolutely terrifying. And this wasn't even Jesus himself. It was merely a reflection of his glory, which I think is a point worth making here. You cannot have a true encounter with Jesus Christ and remain unchanged, even the glory of Christ. In fact, people who say, I'll just tell you, people who say to me, uh, they tried Jesus. You know, I tried Jesus and he just wasn't for me. I'm not personally convinced that they've actually had an encounter with Jesus Christ. They may have tried religion. They may have gone to a church, but I'm, I'm not sure they've had a true revelation of the Christ because you don't encounter Jesus Christ and remain the same. In fact, you, you can go to church, you can learn all the songs, you can read your Bible, you can give in every offering, you can go on the mission strips, you can do all the stuff and still not encounter Jesus Christ. 
which is why I believe that we have churches all over the world that have people in them, some of whom who have never actually encountered the Christ. You can, you can be a religionist without actually knowing God. And those folks honestly are to be pitied more than anyone because they never actually experience the transformation that occurs when you've had a true revelation of Jesus Christ, even though many of them may believe they have, which also makes them, uh, by the way, very dangerous to the church. Paul, in fact, says to avoid them. He writes to Timothy that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty for people who will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 7. This is a description of very religious people. Right? They have a, a form, an appearance of godliness. These are very religious people who have not actually experienced Jesus Christ because those who have encountered him, although not perfect people, are certainly changed people, just as is evident with Daniel throughout this book, who is so deeply affected to his core by the revelations that he's had of Jesus Christ and even of the glory of Jesus reflected in the image of his heavenly messengers, as we see here. Okay, and then as we continue to read, let's pay close attention to what this angel, who again is most likely Gabriel, so we'll refer to him as such for the rest of the message. He says to Daniel, uh, pay attention to what he says, because what he is describing here to Daniel is truly astonishing. I have been mulling it over in my mind and in my heart uh, all week. It's astonishing, not only as a story in and of itself, but in its implication for you and me in this church today. Let's read verses 11 through 14. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God. He's saying from the moment you started to fast and pray, your words have been heard, and I've come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. So there's a battle going on the whole time Daniel's fasting and praying. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. <laughs> okay, the explanation by the angel here as to what has been happening in the unseen realm for the previous three weeks based on the combination of God's sovereign plan for his people, of course, and Daniel's own prayer and fasting is startlingly impressive, particularly when you consider the implications that it has for each of us today. Okay, in verse 12, the angel explains, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God. In other words, Daniel, from the moment you started fasting and praying, your words have been heard, Gabriel says, and I've come here to you now today because of your words, because of your fasting and praying. I've come because of your words, because you're praying and fasting. That's why I'm here. And listen, it's not like uh, Gabriel was sitting on the couch looking for something to do, waiting for his next assignment. No, he was in the middle of a great battle with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So this terrifyingly powerful warrior angel who's reflecting the glory of Christ has come specifically because Daniel has been fasting and praying for his people and their building program. And so the result of that prayer and fasting is that there's three weeks of unseen spiritual activity taking place first. A great battle that takes place before Daniel ever experiences the first inkling of any response to his prayers in the natural realm from God. The moment he starts praying and fasting, a battle ensues in the spirit realm. And then after three weeks of prayer and fasting, three weeks of fighting 
with the evil angelic forces that are trying to stop him. By the way, that word angel uh, that's used to describe the prince of Persia in verse 13 is the Hebrew word sar. It refers to a patron angel. It's used in scripture to describe both good and evil angelic beings who were set as guardians over people and as we see here over entire kingdoms. So Gabriel explains that he's been locked in a fierce battle Right? Because of Daniel's prayer and fasting in the spirit realm, the whole time Daniel's been praying and fasting, he's been fighting with the patron angel over Persia. And the fight is so intense that he finally calls for backup from the more powerful Michael, who's described as one of the chiefs of the Tsar. And the word chief there is the Hebrew word rishon. It means first in rank. So Michael, who according to verse 21 in this chapter and later in chapter 12, is the Tsar, the patron angel to the people of Israel specifically, he's also the first in rank among all the patron angels. And so he shows up to this great battle to temporarily take over for Gabriel. Why? So that Gabriel can get over to Daniel to deliver a message from God. Why? Because Daniel's been fasting and praying. This is remarkable insight about the sheer power of fasting coupled with prayer and how it works, which is, first of all, the fact that unseen activity always precedes any perceptible response to prayer. Okay? When you, when you pray, and particularly when you fast and pray, unseen activity always precedes any perceptible response to prayer. In other words, when we pray, Especially, again, when we fast and pray, there is an unseen spiritual response to that prayer that must take place before we can experience the answer to that prayer in the natural physical realm. And obviously, based on Daniel's experience, we can, uh, that can take some time, right? He spent 21 days fasting and praying. And during that whole time that he knew nothing was happening, there was no response. He sees and feels nothing. Here's nothing from God. No response to that prayer. The whole time he's fasting and praying, there's a war taking place in the spirit realm over Daniel's request. And only at the end of the fast did Daniel get the answer. Okay, listen, it may be a while before you're able to actually see or hear God's answer to your prayers, but that clearly does not mean that he's not answering. Again, the angel says to Daniel, from the first day you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God. The moment you began fasting and praying, Daniel, your words were heard and I've come because of your words. So there's an immediate response by God to Daniel's prayers, but Daniel doesn't see or directly experience that response for three full weeks. Why? Because there's a battle that needed to take place in the unseen realm first. But we really need to take this to heart. And bury this truth deep inside our most basic understanding of how prayer works. Because some of you have been waiting a long time for your prayers to be answered, just like we have as a church. And I know beyond any shadow of a doubt that if you're praying God's word and his will for your own life and for this church with humility, which is where the fasting part comes in, which we'll talk about more in a moment, then I know and in fact am supposed to tell you this morning that God has heard your prayers and even though you haven't seen any evidence of a response by him yet, he has heard you from the moment you began praying and he is in fact responding to your prayers. Amen. You simply need to know today with all confidence and faith, that if you're still waiting on an answer to that prayer, that there are spiritual battles taking place in the unseen realm on your behalf as a direct result of those prayers. And that needs to take place before you experience the answer that you've been waiting for. Because listen, prayer is a spiritual transaction with a natural outcome. Okay? Prayer is a spiritual transaction with a natural outcome. It's not the other way around. And yet we really struggle sometimes trusting in the sovereignty of God over every situation and circumstance in our lives because we can't always discern God's hand at work on our behalf because so much of that work is happening in the unseen realm. In fact, Daniel struggled with it even after he was given a glimpse of what was taking place on behalf of him and his people, as we see in the next five verses. Let's read them together, verses 15 through 19. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? Now, For now no strength remains in me and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. 
And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. So Daniel gets a glimpse of what has actually been happening for the past three weeks while he's been fasting and praying. And it upsets him so much. The weight of the reality of the spiritual activity, the war that is raging in the unseen realm over his people because of the evil forces of the enemy who want to stop God's will from being accomplished and Daniel's prayers from being answered. And I, I, know, I know we often wonder and probably pray sometimes, uh, right, God, why is there no response? I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I've prayed that a few times here for this church. Like, hey, God, I'm not asking for a jet, Right? I'm not asking people for money to, to, to buy myself a, a Ferrari. We, we just need more space. Like, why am I not giving, getting an answer? Why is there no response? Why haven't I been given an answer to my prayer? It's been weeks. It's been months. It's been years. Look, this may be one of those situations, if that's you in your own prayer life, this may be one of those situations where ignorance is bliss. Because I think if we were able to always see what was happening in response to our prayers in the unseen realm, we may not be able to handle it. Certainly it was the case with Daniel. He became physically ill, severe pain, he says, and so weak that the wind was knocked out of him. He couldn't breathe. Okay, this scene for Daniel, the glimpse of spiritual activity that was taking place because of Daniel's prayers and on Daniel's behalf, by the way, was nonetheless devastating. It was too much for Daniel to take in, and so the angel touched him to help him regain his composure. So look, when, when we pray and we don't immediately experience a palpable response by God to that prayer, it's important for us to understand that that does not mean God is not responding. It simply means we cannot yet perceive his response, and in fact, may be best for us that we don't until he chooses to sovereignly reveal that to us in his own timing and in his own way. Unless we think this is just an ancient story, by the way, that only applies to Daniel in his day or in that specific instance, listen to what Paul says about all believers in Ephesians 6, 12, and 13. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He's describing what's happening in Daniel, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Right? Sounds a lot like what's happening in Daniel here, doesn't it? Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. In other words, don't give in to fear or despair or doubt or hopelessness. Now, Paul says stand firm because the forces of God are fighting the battle in the unseen realm on your behalf. Okay? Conflicts on earth reflect conflicts in heaven. That's why Jesus told us to pray God's will be done on earth as what? As it is in heaven. Because there's an unseen spiritual activity that always precedes any perceptible response to prayer. And so Paul teaches us to stand firm in the meantime. Stand firm because the answer will come just as the angel teaches Daniel in verse 19 when he tells him, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. In other words, stand firm, even though you don't see the good result of God working in your life yet, because in this perfect timing, you will. Andrew Murray uh, once said, prayer is reaching out after the unseen. Fasting is letting go of all that is seen and temporal. Fasting helps express, deepen, confirm the resolution that we are ready to sacrifice anything, even ourselves, to attain what we seek for the kingdom of God. Let's finish our text for this morning where we find one more really significant point about God's unseen work in our lives. Verses 20 and 21. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. So the angel is about to reveal more of the vision to Daniel, which we find, by the way, in chapter 11, if you keep reading. But he also explains to Daniel that he has to go soon because he has to get back to the fight that he was in the middle of on his way to meet with Daniel. And not only that, but he explains that the demonic forces over Greece are coming to join the party as well. So essentially, the angel shows up and he says, hey, Daniel, look, I'm sorry I'm late. I've been fighting with the evil forces over Persia. 
So I called for Michael, the angelic protector of your people, to take over for me so I could fly over here and deliver a message from God in response to your prayer and fasting. But I need to be quick about it because I have to go back and finish beating up on a few more bad guys before your prayers can ultimately be fulfilled. That's the RSV, Ruchi Standard Version, in case you're wondering. Uh, The truth is, it's an awe-inspiring glimpse of what happens in the unseen realm when we fast and pray. It is strong evidence that God always finishes what he starts. God always finishes what he starts. See, because not only does Gabriel explain that he has to go back to fight the patron angels of Persia and Greece to finish that battle, but he says something very insightful to Daniel in verse 21 as well that we don't want to miss. Just before he reveals the vision to Daniel that you find again if you read into chapter 11, before he reveals that vision, he says to Daniel, I'm going to tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. Now, he's clearly not talking about the Bible here because what he's about to reveal to Daniel from the book of truth hadn't yet been recorded as scripture. Obviously, Daniel wrote all of this down after it happened, and yet the angel refers to the vision that he hasn't revealed yet as being inscribed in the book of truth. Uh, The book of truth that Gabriel uses is the Hebrew phrase kathab emeth. It's literally translated as the writing of truth, and in this instance, it's referring to God's record of truth in general, of which the Bible is one expression. In fact, there are other references in the Bible that refer to books that are in heaven that contain the records of human works or human destinies. And the fact that it's inscribed as the, or described as the writing of truth here, or the book of truth, clarifies for us that the events in our lives that have yet to happen are already recorded in heaven by God. We already read Psalm 139, 16, which again says, In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them before you ever existed. In Ephesians 2, 10, Paul says, We're as workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God formed every one of our days and recorded them in his book before we ever existed, which not only tells us that he's not surprised by anything, which should give you great comfort, But it also means that our entire story has been written, which means that what God has begun in you, he's going to finish. He's not hampered or held up by time as we know it because he created time. He's not surprised by what happens to us throughout our life stories because he's the author of our stories. He's not waiting to find out how the story will end because he's already written and recorded the end in the books that are in heaven, okay? Uh, Our future as followers of Christ is secure. In fact, we're assured that he will finish what he started in us. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi that I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6. God doesn't leave loose ends. He doesn't abandon projects. He doesn't give up even when we do. Now, God always finishes what he starts, and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, then he has begun a good work in you that he will finish. And so whatever it is you're praying for, if you're praying according to his word and his will, you can rest assured he's going to provide you with the answer that you need because that answer has already been formed and written in his books, forever recorded in heaven to be revealed at his appointed time, not ours. So you understand what you're praying about today has already been written in his books from before time existed. And of course, we don't have access to those books and the events recorded in them. And so for us, those answers to and fulfillments of our prayers are yet unseen. Yet that in no way diminishes the fact that they're as real as the book that I'm holding in my hand right now. The point is this. If you go through life only being attentive to the work of God that you can see in the natural, physical realm, then you're missing out on the most powerful work that he's engaged in, the work that he's constantly doing in the unseen realm on your behalf. His most powerful, most effective, most life-altering work is done in the spirit realm. Our salvation, of course, being the ultimate example of that. It's the unseen work that truly changes the world. In fact, you know that the Lord's prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples to pray in Matthew parallels Daniel's prayer back in chapter 9 of this book. And if you go back three verses before Jesus begins that prayer in Matthew 6, verse 9, and read what he says to them just before teaching them what to pray. In verse 6, he teaches them how to pray. He says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret. 
and your father who sees in secret will reward you. It all ties together. You see, God's most powerful work is done out of sight. It's unseen in secret. And when Jesus prays that, he's specifically referring to the power of prayer when performed with great humility. In contrast to, he says, the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Matthew 6, 5. It's why we're commanded when we fast not to make a show of it, right? This is where the fasting part comes in, because fasting brings us low before God. It is intended to, okay? People talk all the time about um, fasting social media or fasting television or fasting some other activity that they normally engage in. What they're actually describing is not fasting. What they're describing is self-denial, which is important. We're certainly commanded in Scripture to deny ourselves, okay? So it is important that we practice that, but you understand none of those things are fasting, if you're, if you're off of social media for a month, you're not fasting. You're denying yourself social media. That's a good thing, but it's not fasting. Every time the Bible refers to fasting, it is first of all coupled with prayer, and secondly, it is always referring to denying yourself food. Why? Because you don't need social media to live. You don't need television to live. Right? When you deny yourself those things, that may be good, but those things aren't essential to life. Food, however, is. You can live forever without Facebook. You may not believe that, young people, but you can live forever without Facebook. You can't live forever without food. You see, when you fast, you're denying yourself an essential element of living, which is why it brings us low. It humbles us before God, unlike anything else, because your body and your mind and your emotions begin to feel the depravity of life without food, and it humbles us before God. And clearly, according to Jesus in the story we find in Daniel, when you come before God in humility, depriving yourself of something essential to life, and then you pray, no matter what is going on in the heavens or on the earth, God will respond. Do you want to see God move in your life this year? The number one thing you can do to affect change in your own life is fast and pray. There is nothing else that compares. Do we want to see God move on behalf of this church this year? We can have all the fundraisers in the world, but it won't hold a candle to us fasting and praying as a body. So don't give up hope over your prayers that seem to be unanswered. On the contrary, Hide yourself away with God and trust that when you fast and pray, he is working on your behalf in secret, unseen places until in his sovereignty and perfect timing, he reveals that work to you. And in that time, while you wait for the physical outcome of that spiritual activity, take rest in the counsel of Gabriel, O man greatly loved. Fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. Let's pray.